Hello and welcome to The Melting Pot. I'm your host, Dominic Monkhouse. The Melting Pot is a result of my hunger for optimising business performance. Scaling up organisations, corporate culture, customer addiction, building high-performing teams, along with a few other obsessions. I've spent the last several years working for and with some of the most successful top performing companies in the world. And this podcast is my attempt to synthesize what I've learned along the way, to help you build a higher quality business and live a more fulfilling life. If you enjoy the podcast, you can find more information on today's episode. We do cracking show notes. They're at dominicmonkhouse.com. Hello and welcome to The Melting Pot. Today I'm talking to Mike Payton, or as everyone calls him, Payton. Payton is an EOS implementer. In fact, he is in charge globally of implementation of EOS. EOS is the Entrepreneur's Operating System, based on a book written by Gino Wickman called Traction, and then a follow-up book co-authored by Gino and Payton called Get a Grit, which is a leadership fable in the style of Patrick Lencioni. We chat today about why you might want a system at all, why you might want a coach, and we talk about some of the tools in EOS. We talk about rocks and we talk about the level 10 meeting. And I've seen firsthand how both of these tools can change an organization. Why might you want a system? Well, quite often, Entrepreneurs are visionaries. They start a business, they get it to a particular point, and then they find themselves doing things that they're not best at. They're not having any fun. It's just not what they signed up for. And an implementation, an execution methodology can help you unlock the future potential in your business or turn it back into the business that you want it to be where you're doing what you do best every day and having fun. So a great conversation with Peyton. I enjoyed it immensely. I'm sure you will too. I'm Mike Peyton. I'm a certified EOS implementer, best-selling author, and the visionary for EOS worldwide. And I'm super passionate about helping entrepreneurs get what they want for their businesses. And, and Peyton, what when you say visionary, the, the, yeah, that has meaning in the EOS world, doesn't it? What, what does that mean? Yeah, it's, it's from a concept that the people who start entrepreneurial companies, uh, almost invariably, at some point in the genesis of those organizations, hit a ceiling where the demands of their time become less and less about building something new and more and more about keeping something running well, keeping the trains running on time is a nice little word picture to describe that. And the vast majority of uh, visionaries in the world aren't particularly good at that stuff, nor do they like it very much. And so when we're implementing EOS with a leadership team of an entrepreneurial company, it's a concept we share with the leadership team so they can determine whether or not the person who started their organization is a visionary or an integrator. And depending on what they discover, they make sure to fill out the leadership team with the appropriate complement to the skill sets in the room. And I find that a really interesting concept because quite often people have got a business to a particular point and they feel that they're failing or they're not enjoying themselves anymore or the business no longer is any fun. Right. And I remember reading the uh, reading Traction and, well, and Get a Grip and thinking uh, here was a way in which I could explain that split to people. Yeah. And, and it, what, what your listeners need to hear is it is inevitable. Every organization, every team of people, and every individual within a growing organization is going to hit a ceiling. You're going to run smack dab into something you can't fix yourself. And um, a big part of the work we do is helping owners and leadership teams understand what all the root causes of the unique ceiling they've hit are and implement some simple practical tools that will help them break through that ceiling, take their business to the next level and and live a life that is full of passion and excellence and enjoyment, if also full of dogged commitment, hard work, long hours, et cetera. We're not making everybody turn their entrepreneurial journey into a walk in the park, but we are reconnecting them to what they love to do and are best at. 
I was leading, I was uh, reading a thing the other day, which was actually they'd done some brain imaging and where I guess a visionary and an integrator get their serotonin buzz from is in a different place. You know, the visionary has an idea and gets the joy out of the idea and the integrator gets the joy out of the idea being turned into something. And so that our brains, brains of visionaries and integrators are wired differently. Yeah, and what, we, what we'll what we typically talk about is a visionary is the person who has 20 ideas a week and thinks every one of them will take the business to the moon and the rest of the leadership team knows there's one or two worth really diving into right now. A visionary is a creative problem solver. Give them a big problem nobody's ever been able to solve. They're really good at that. Get them in the trenches where they have to dive into the details and talk to a bunch of people and look at data to solve the problem. Not so much. Uh, visionaries don't like tough conversations with people who don't fit the culture and aren't great at their jobs. They want somebody else to do that. My favorite thing a visionary says to me regularly is, Peyton, I'm really good at managing people who don't need to be managed. <laughs> well, that's really not a thing. So, so whereas integrators love beating the drum, they love driving accountability. If there's a tough conversation to have, I've got it. What are, give me three data points, I'll go talk to them. And, and so there are people, the message to your listeners who are visionary entrepreneurs who loved getting their company going and taking it to a certain level and creating new things, is there are people on the planet who are born to help you take the business to the next level by doing all the parts of that running the organization job that you aren't well suited for. And we'd urge you to go find your perfect puzzle piece and and match up with an integrator that's a great fit. I think when you look at the data, you find that those businesses that don't do that, certainly in the UK, it's about a million pounds. Maybe it's a million, million and a half in the US. It's that, it's that up to maybe 10 to 12, and they haven't, they haven't got that partner. Yeah, and I, what I would say is I, the actual data is a little tough. I think that I've seen companies work perfectly without implementing a lot of the concepts and tools of EOS up to as many as 50 to 100 employees when the, the people who started the organization are decent runners of going concerns, right? So everybody hits the ceiling at a different place. It's definitely somewhere between your fifth employee and your hundredth probably where it just gets so complex and you're not having any fun and there are committees in my organization all of a sudden, and no entrepreneur in his or her right mind wants to be part of a committee or even know that a committee exists. And so somewhere you're going to hit a ceiling, and when you do, you need to bring a little structure. So look, t let me take you back, because when did Gino change your life? What was, it, what, was, what was the year? What was your Damascene moment? So I had moved to Minneapolis in 2000. 11 to run a $7 million company. It was my fourth entrepreneurial experience after starting my career in banking, always feeling like that was where I was going to learn about the art and science of business and strike out on my own someday. And I was really frustrated. I was trying to run a company. I was trying to take it to the next level. The founding entrepreneur and I were not on the same page. And I was looking around for something that would help us align and work together to achieve what the company was able to achieve. And a neighbor introduced me to the book Traction. It had just been published. And uh, once I fell in love with it, agreed to introduce me to Gino. And so I was part of the first uh, boot camp class in Detroit, uh, Michigan, that stuck uh, 12 years ago. It was 12 years ago this November. And I've been doing this ever since. And it felt when I went to Detroit and, and met Gino that everything I had lived through in my life had prepared me uh, for this cool work that we get to do every day with entrepreneurs. Did you go back to your seven million pound business and, and fix it? Was that? No, I, I tried to use the tools and the concepts uh, in EOS and it quickly became clear to me that Anything other than the way that business had always run was never going to work. And it, it was a terrible fit for me. The business is an excellent business. The founding entrepreneur is an excellent entrepreneur. It was just that her style and approach and my style and approach were two vastly different things. And 
you know, one of the greatest lessons I learned out of that experience is I hadn't properly evaluated the cultural and stylistic differences between the two of us. I evaluated everything very logically. And in the end, the logic didn't have anything to do with the reason it wasn't a great match. It's so hard. I mean, we don't get much practice. It's funny because as as employers, we might get a lot of practice interviewing. But as an employee, you don't get much practice picking. I mean, you know, not that many people have hundreds of jobs in their lives. Right. Well, and when you're talking about leading an entrepreneurial company, it's kind of like a marriage. And so most people wouldn't get married with the same number of interactions with their business, you know, with their spouse as they would their business partner when you agree to, there's always this time pressure and you're afraid of asking too many questions or peering beneath the covers too much. And the bottom line is either there's a cultural fit or they're not. And so hindsight being 2020, it all worked out beautifully. I just would do it a little bit differently. <laughs> But look, it got you. It got you to be in a position where you were in a in a room with Gino. Exactly, I was put on the planet to be on the journey I'm on today, and that was a scary, frustrating, worrisome period of my life. But it it brought me to the place I'm supposed to be. So very grateful for it. And so, how did you get to co-author the the next book? What was the thinking there? Well, so in the early um, state, you know, this was before there was a community of professional EOS implementers around the world with 330 people in it. And so it was a very small group and we were all encouraged to um, create our own vision for our implementer practice and execute on that vision. And I was an English major in college and had been a competitive public speaker during my college career. And so writing and speaking were always part of my thinking about the way I would share EOS with the world. And so a couple of years in, once my implementer practice had stabilized, I approached Gino and said, hey, I'd really like to write the next EOS book. And he said, you know, I've got that on my list too. And we compared notes about what we were thinking and we were almost 100% on the same page. Business fable, we both wanted to do that. And so it was just a, a project made in heaven. And um, Probably the hardest thing I've ever done or will ever do was push a quality business book over the finish line with a professional publishing firm is a lot more work than most people think it is, uh, but super proud of the end result and excited about the plans we reached. It just seemed to me that that's really hard to do. Whenever I read a business fable, you know, either yours or Lencioni's or wherever, I just think, Writing this as a textbook surely must be easier. It must be harder to, to work out what you're trying to do and then tell a story so you end up with the right answer. Well, you know, I'm lucky to have been raised in a family with a couple of teachers as grandparents, and I grew up in their house, and both of them were adept storytellers. My grandfather was a high school math teacher, but he loved story problems. And my grandmother uh, had grown up in India, and she was a storyteller in her own right. And so to me, it was a very natural way of doing the work, but it is part of what made it difficult is you end up with the characters walking around in your brain um, and you don't really turn it off. So you know, I would wake up at three o'clock in the morning and have to write stuff down. It was, it was very oppressive, but you know, that's, that's what telling a story is all about, right? You've got to tie up all the loose ends and you got to be consistent with the characters. So that's also what made it fun and rewarding. Yeah, no, fantastic. And do you think there's a different type of person who uh, gets the most out of a fable versus, you know, is, is, is it an easier way to get your head around the head around the tools? Is to... Yeah. So that was actually one of the data points Gino and I had compared when we decided to do this is that we felt like, now, I think traction is the most engaging, hardest to put down how-to manual I've ever read, okay? But it is still a how-to manual, and I am more of an experiential learner than I am a manual reader and learner. And so we really thought that perhaps, we weren't sure, Get a Grip would resonate a little bit more with people who learn by watching other people do things or or seeing a story. And then the other funny little thing we said is an awful lot of visionaries who read traction, and I'm using air quotes, uh, since your listeners will not be able to tell, 
a lot of visionaries who read traction actually read the forward and part of the first chapter and then hand it to somebody else on their leadership team and say, we got to run our business this way. <laughs> and we thought that perhaps a few of them would finish, get a grip because they want to know how the story turns out. Well, and I guess they're in it, right? At least they've got, there's a, char- there's a character in it that they identify with. They, they see themselves and at least a dozen of them have accused me of writing the book about their people because when they see a character in the book behave like one member of their leadership team, they just assume I wrote it about them. So, <laughs> yes. yes, indeed. Are there any, if you, were, if you had your time again, is there anything that you would, you would have changed about the book? I don't think so. I would have been more prepared for how much more work there is to do after you're done with the initial manuscript. That editing and publishing process was really surprising to me. Um, but but I'm really proud of the outcome and uh, the sales of the book continue increasing week in and week out, month in and month out uh, since it was published in 2012. So I'm super proud of it. And how many, how many copies you sold now? Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30,000. I don't have the number in front of me, but it's a, it's a really compelling amount. What's, what's really exciting about it, and our publisher says this never happens, is as awareness about EOS around the world grows, the sales numbers continue to grow. And what normally happens is you get a, a big launch and then things tail off. And so we're all very um, grateful for the fact that the audience seems to be growing. It, it means there's a story that needs to be told and we're creating value in the world. Let's try and unpick some of these, uh, some of these tools. So uh, if you're an entrepreneur and today you don't have a system, what does putting a system like EOS in place mean for, for somebody's business? All EOS is, is a complete set of simple concepts and practical tools that help the leadership teams of entrepreneurial companies make better decisions, create a clearer, simpler vision, get everybody on the same page and execute day in and day out with real discipline and accountability. And as a bit of a byproduct of all that hard work, it also helps the people who own and run the business become a more healthy, cohesive functional leadership team, because even people who intend to behave that way in an entrepreneurial company are often so busy that they don't take the time to do that. And they tend to look down their nose a little bit at the value of being a healthy team aligned around a common vision because they're just so busy. It seems fluffy or, you know, I've heard it referred to as soft skills and And, you know, the bottom line is if you're surrounded by a bunch of people you love and you want to do great work together with, the journey is just so much more fun and rewarding. And so that's what EOS is all about. And lots of other systems, too. When I'm uh, when I'm starting work with a client, I often interview I will always interview the leadership team. And I'll ask them a question, which is, you know, on a scale of one to 10, what's the best team you've ever been on? And people have invariably got a nine or a 10 team they've been on. And I say, and give me a score for this team. And they go, oh, six or seven. (laughs) And so, you know, they know it's, it's like being in a bad meeting. Like, you know, if you're if you're speaking in public, you say, who's wasted their time in a meeting? Every hand in the room goes up. And then when you say to people, what makes a great meeting? They all know it. So there's something about being on a great team or being in a, somehow there's something that the, the collective wisdom of the group goes down when everybody gets in a room. Well, I call it the myth of the others a little bit, right? In that (laughs) often the reason for the six or seven isn't the person you see when you look in the mirror every morning. And in my experience, the only way to a truly healthy team, a true nine or 10, is that everybody in the room takes personal accountability for being the best team member they can and for putting the greater good of their organization before their own personal needs and agendas. And I'm not minimizing the difficulty associated with that. It's really hard to do. Even business owners whose entire worth and self-image is tied into the value of their business sometimes are too selfish to subjugate their own needs to the needs of their business. But that's what it's all about. And it's a journey, Dom. You're never going to you know, arrive there. It's a lifelong journey to be a healthy team and healthy team member. 
Oh, <laughs> absolutely. If you think about people who don't succeed on this journey, because you've done, how many companies have you, have you coached in EOS now? Yeah, so I personally have worked with 120 entrepreneurial leadership teams and done over 1,200 sessions over the last 12 years. And so if anybody knows what it takes to succeed or fail, I guess it's, I guess it's, it's you. Every once in a while, Gino and I still will call and leave long voicemail messages with one another after a session. And we always end with it. You really can't make this stuff up because <laughs> some amazing stuff. And, and, and I mean that in a good, bad and ugly sense. I mean, I have seen some world class, selfless, generous, helpful leadership moves that just blow me away and make me really emotional. And then I've seen some selfish, couldn't care how much damage I do. You know, it's all over the board that you get to see when, you, but the, the people who don't succeed, you know, there's a, there's probably a dozen items I could cite here, but I put at the top of my list, the people who are more interested in being right than being effective. That is a deal killer when you're trying to build a healthy team. And, you know, a, a team that walks into the room with their arms crossed, certain there's six to eight people in there, and every one of them is already certain they know the right answer. And the minute the other five or seven people on this team agree with me, we can move forward. But until they do, I'm standing my ground. That's the, that's the thing that you can't fix. You can't help people that, that don't want your help. It's like the people who buy a gym membership but never go, right? So in love with the idea of being fit, but not being prepared to actually sweat much. Yeah, they want the pill they can take that's going to melt the pounds away. And I'm still trying to come up with that formula. I know I'd be a wealthy. <laughs> um, look, uh, I just want to pick up on, I, I'd love to talk about some of the tools. And so, you know, some of the things that, uh, the level 10 meeting, for example, one of my clients uses EOS and I've always been impressed with how that as a system can help people transform meetings, which would be dysfunctional into some something. Perhaps you could, uh, if people haven't ever heard of a level 10 meeting, you could give people a sense of what some of that's about. Yeah, you, you bet. So um, the level 10 meeting is one of the tools we teach when we're helping a client strengthen their traction component, which is what brings the ability to focus on the right stuff and execute with discipline and accountability to the whole organization. And the level 10 meeting in particular was born out of Gino's observation and frustration that while getting a team aligned requires time and full engagement from every member of a leadership team, the quality of the time most leadership teams spend together is ranked as one of the lowest things they do. Most important, but lowest quality, right? And so what he did is he studied the meeting disciplines that were out there in the ether, and he came up with a great agenda that would ensure that a leadership team was connecting the circles of its individual members properly. And the two problems he was trying to solve is a team that never connects its circles, never meets. Everybody's operating as a cowboy or cowgirl, an independent practitioner focusing on their own silos. And the only team that team ever comes together to make a collective decision is when something broke. And they refer to that as a post-mortem meeting, which literally means something just died, we'd better call a meeting and figure out what killed it, okay? And that's wasteful and inefficient. And then the other way of screwing things up in a fast-growing entrepreneurial company is a team that doesn't allow anybody to make any independent decisions. And so their circles overlap tightly and everything is collaborative and they're constantly meeting and they're never making any decisions and they're never moving forward. And so all we did with the level 10 meeting was put a meeting agenda together that assures that we spend the first 15 minutes checking in and getting clear on whether we're hitting our numbers, completing our priorities and keeping our customers and employees happy. We check in on personal accountability real quickly by seeing how we did at completing our to do's from the last week. And then we spend 60 minutes of a 90 minute weekly meeting 
prioritizing and resolving the most pressing issues facing our team, because that's why you meet. You shouldn't meet to share information. There's a million different ways to efficiently share information amongst a group of people. You should meet to prioritize and resolve your issues. So decisions are made, actions are taken. We all walk out of the meeting week in and week out, feeling like we're responding to the biggest issues our business is facing. We are keeping all the important stuff on track. We're keeping our customers and employees happy. And we go back into our business for another week and execute independently until we come back together the following week. That's the level 10 in a nutshell. And it's it's a beautiful little piece of work and a simple tool that makes a real difference. You're absolutely right. And I've seen it because it overcomes the the most senior person in the room sets the agenda. The agenda doesn't change. Uh, people feel like they're not collaborating. Or, you know, all of those things get get fixed. Here's a little nugget. Uh, that I love. At the, the reason it's called a level 10 meeting is at the end of the meeting, we actually ask all the participants to say out loud how good they thought the meeting was, one to 10 with 10 being best. So that if today's meeting was lousy, I say, I give today a seven, Dom, you took the floor and kept it for 20 minutes on a two minute issue. I mean, you're wasting everybody's time here you got to be more efficient. And so instead of me complaining to my cohorts about you, I'm asked to provide you with open and honest feedback that'll make us better at meeting as a team. It's revolutionary concept, but so simple and necessary, it really works. Well, it, it, it plays to the, the problem that you outlined earlier, which is that people are playing in their silos. The leader of sales thinks sales is his, is his team, and the leader of finance thinks finance is their team or her team. And, and actually, the leadership team is there. That has to be their number one team. No, team one, as Patrick Marcioni refers to it. Yeah, for sure. Couldn't agree more. And, and you know, you can uh, certainly when I've been in sports teams, people on your team give you, give you feedback on your performance. In a championship team, the other championship athletes are the people who put the most pressure on their teammates to perform at a consistently high level so that the head coach or the general manager or whatever you call the person truly in charge of fielding the team doesn't have to do it every time. Um, And that's the kind of accountability uh, EOS and lots of other business systems are, are attempting to instill in the organizations that are running on those systems. What do you, when, when people have picked up and read the books and you end up working with them, is there something that they've thought is a sort of a number one uh, mistake or a number one, or, or maybe it's not even number one, maybe there's a handful of things that, that people are expecting you to do that you don't do or a misconception? You know, one of the things we're always very clear to point out to a leadership team is a professional EOS implementer is not a consultant or a futurist or a strategic thinker for hire. We are facilitators, coaches and drivers of accountability and teachers of how to implement EOS. And so when a client is looking for me to tell them what strategy or tactic to pursue, I look at them and say, you'd be making a terrible mistake to ask me. You need that expertise here on your leadership team. And if you don't have it, this is a people issue. We've got to go solve that. So that's a, that's a common one. And then the other common thing I think I see is I think, I think people selectively forget that as an organization grows from five to 500 employees, that the level of maturity, experience, and savvy of its leadership team and mid-level managers needs to keep growing along with the complexity of the business. And so just because somebody's always been in charge of finance since you started the business 22 years ago and they're loyal doesn't mean they're meeting the current needs of the person you have in your leadership team seat around finance. And a lot of humans are just afraid because of the strong bond they have with the humans around them of having that tough conversation with the person on their team. And what I've I've observed more frequently than I can count on all my hands and toes is once the conversation happens, the poor person in charge of finance is so relieved. Oh my God, I've been 
wondering when you were going to figure this out for the last 10 years. <laughs> I know I'm not any good at this job anymore. Thank God we're having this conversation. So, you know, have the conversation with your people as the needs of your company change. Even your seat is at risk, whether you're great as the, the visionary leader of the company or the integrator of your company, someday you're going to need to replace yourself. And so thinking about every seat that way is really a valuable asset. And most people really struggle with that because of, you know, their good and loyal feeling about their people. Yeah. Look, I see that with particularly, as you mentioned, the CEO, you know, at some point they, they had a functional skill. And, and often that sort of 15 million or 20 million bit, those that hang on to that and still think they can be the CEO and do that functional stuff, often they become, they become the, um, the break on their business because they don't want to give it up. I wish I remember who said this, but the quotation is the bottleneck is always at the top of the bottle. <laughs> yeah. I think it's Drucker. I could be wrong about that. But they, but somehow they, I think they're hung up that they don't think running the company is a proper thing, right? And so they, they've got this emotional attachment to sales or marketing or product. And if they give that up, somehow their sense of self is diminished. Yeah. And, and, and again, that's the approach we take when we're implementing EOS, Don, is that we ask the leadership team to behave for a while as though they're the board of directors, and they don't have a, ro a role in the organization, and they're not going to have a role tomorrow, because that allows you to set aside history and ego and really focus on the needs of the business. And so we'll say, you know, if you were running a professional uh, world football club, and you had a, a position called midfielder, what, what do you need your midfielder to do? And we have them list what a midfielder does. And then we look at them and say, would you rather have Lionel Messi or you in that role? And they say Lionel Messi every time. And it's easier to get them to think about what they really need in each seat when they're thinking about something other than their own business and their own job. Yeah. And then get them to reflect. Look, you were able to make that decision when you're running a football team. Now you've got to make those decisions running your business. That's exactly right. When you when it wasn't your ego affected by the obvious skill difference between you and Messi. Yeah. What do you say to organizations that when they haven't got rocks and do they think that and you're trying to get them to get this whole concept of prioritizing the right things and getting meeting rhythm? What? This is another uh, root cause of hitting the ceiling, right? When there's three people and 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 we're all working in a small space and you know, when I'm not sure what my priority is, I just yell to the founder of the company, hey, what do you want me to work on today? And he says, you know, I want you to work on that spreadsheet I just sent you. That's easy, right? When you have 40 people, it's bedlam, right? And so when we set rocks with a leadership team, very often, the first time we do it, the people on the way out after the first full day we spend together say to me, Peyton, this is the first time this team of five people has been on the same page with our three to seven priorities for the company for any stretch of time. Thank you. Right. All rock setting is, as you know, is getting agreement about our handful of priorities, knowing that when we're done with these priorities, the other 87 other things we'd love to prioritize will still be on a list somewhere. But when everything is important, nothing's important. And so all we're doing is teaching the team slowly, it takes some time to build that muscle of prioritization. So when they have to make a choice between this important thing get, getting done and this essential life or death priority getting done, they get really good at choosing this and following through until it's complete. Well, and I also, uh, there's two things I say about when I speak to employees in businesses I go and visit. I say the employees never complain. They're getting overpraised. Nobody keep the, the, the nobody ever says that to me. No, the people here don't keep telling me I'm doing a great job every day. I wish they'd stop. And the other thing is, they say they never say, "God, we we're so focused." What they what they say all the time is they say there aren't enough priorities. <laughs> we start 
the, this company's great at starting a hundred things. If only you could finish one occasionally, it would be even better. Exactly right. And therein lies the rub, right? Entrepreneurs are world-class starters and average to below average finishers. And, and, and as a general rule, and it requires skill, determination, patience, focus, um, you know, a lot of my, one of my clients had a commitment he made to his leadership team one year after getting some very constructive feedback. And the commitment was, I need to remember in the alphabet, the letters B through Y exist. <laughs> because he was one of those people who the minute he thought something was possible, the project was already complete and he was on to his next idea and his leadership team had told him, no, no, no. Each letter in the alphabet between A and Z, Matt, is work that needs to be done. So you can't move on to the next alphabet. So you get it. That's just a common entrepreneurial thing. Well, look at, at Pier 1. I had a VP of customer experience, Scott Davies, and say so I would jump on with the customer experience team every week for the weekly call. The agenda was always I would start and talk about things I was thinking about. And at the end of that, after about 15 or 20 minutes of me speaking, Scott would say, Dom, all great ideas, none of them for today. Let's get on with the agenda. <laughs> he might have been an integrator. Just <laughs> totally, to clear. totally. That's what the US Worldwide's integrator does to me every week. And she did it this morning, actually, a couple hours ago. Well, when I hired him, the thing that I remember from the interview is he said, Dom, I'm the type of guy who straightens pictures in other people's houses. And I'm like, <laughs> I said, you're for me. That's good. Yeah. yeah. So here's a question. It's important to have a system. What about, you're, you're going to be biased, I guess, because you've done it with 120 customers, 120 clients. But, you know, what do you think, coach or not have a coach? You know, I'm of the mind that, it, that changing your own leadership team and organization from within it is exceptionally difficult. One of the advantages I have as a certified EOS implementer in working with my clients is I can be an accountability coach and not have to see the people on my team every day for 89 days a quarter. So when they walk out of a meeting ticked off at me because we poke the scab on an issue that's been lingering for a long time, they get over it pretty quick. When they're working alongside their CEO or founder or integrator, that scab tends to fester. And so I just think, and you know, two things an EOS implementer brings is, uh, is an expertise about how to apply the EOS tools in an entrepreneurial company and an absolute objectivity about the greater good of the business. So we all talk about how we have a fiduciary obligation to the organization, no one member of the leadership team. And so that is perfect neutrality and a neutral presence who's an expert in a leadership team can often turn what is going to be unhealthy, unresolved conflict into a reasonably calm, fully engaged, hey, we got to move forward with some decision. Let's make the best decision we can today. And we know that 90 days from now, if we made a mistake, we'll all be comfortable bringing this back up again. And so that value that an outsider can bring to a team dynamic is just really powerful. And when you combine it with expertise about how to implement EOS, it's pretty important in my mind. Do you, have you got a sense of how much faster people might go, coach versus no coach, or...? Uh, you know, I don't. What we what we find, we do have data on how long and how many sessions on average it takes a leadership team working with an EOS implementer to implement all the tools, strengthen the six key components of their business, and then feel like they can run their quarterly and annual sessions on our own on their own. And on average, that's two years, 10 full day sessions over two years. And that is by design in our model. We are maniacal about wanting to create independent entrepreneurs and leadership teams that don't need a coach or a consultant or an implementer forever. They've got this. And Gino built the system to be simple and accessible and useful at every level of the organization because we don't want to be a crutch for a lifetime with leadership teams. So 
on average, we get you there in two years. And there are some self-implementing companies who are able to do it that quickly on their own. And, and there are some self-implementing companies who could do it for 100 years and, and not get there. But I'm not, I'm not even sure, Dom, to be perfectly candid with you that an, a world-class implementer would get them there. And after. we don't keep data on that. And what I would tell your listeners is, no matter whether you intend to use an implementer to implement EOS or not, I would do the first step in the process with a member of our professional implementer community. There's no charge for that. And what it does is it allows you to get a clear sense of what a company running on EOS looks and feels like before you start your own journey. And it gives you access to an expert on the occasion when you need one, because you're going to have a something blow up on you two or three sessions into your own journey. And it's nice to have an expert to call when that happens. Sure. Peyton, if knowing what you know now, if I was to send you back in time, what bit of knowledge would you go back with and where would you go? <laughs> well, I, the thing I said earlier about why EOS doesn't work is true of me as a young man. And then I'm one of those people who, as a young man, felt it was more important to be right than be effective. And so that's the bit of knowledge. Uh, nobody really cares, Peyton. Go, go be the best teammate you can be. Offer your wisdom. Trust the people who are accountable for the outcomes to make the decisions they make. Contribute mightily to following through on whatever is decided. And people will recognize what you have to offer. And good things are going to happen. And, you know, for the early part of my adulthood, I was terrible at that. And uh, it's a big regret, and, and I'm glad I'm cured, but I, I rubbed a lot of people the wrong way for most of my career. Brilliant. Um, and what about some book recommendations? Well, obviously, I'm going to recommend the five books in the Traction Library, starting with Traction. Um, I'm a huge Patrick Lencioni fan. I can't imagine any of your listeners haven't heard that before, but anything Lencioni's ever written is brilliant. I'm a, a big fan of The Advantage, which is sort of a synthesis of a lot of his work. I think it simplifies what the value of organizational health is and what the role of a leadership team is in creating it. And so anybody who hasn't read that. And then I'm a longtime uh, strategic coach member and a big fan of Dan Sullivan. So anything Dan Sullivan has written, there's a concept of Dan's uh, called gap, the gap and the gain that is a really good place to start. It's about the entrepreneur's constant striving for the next accomplishment and the way it has a tendency to um, manifest itself as never being satisfied and never celebrating success and never taking a moment to reflect on how much progress you've made on your lifelong journey to whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. And, Really valuable insight for me. So Dan Sullivan's strategic coach would be another thing I'd recommend. Your description there of that is very similar to Gallup, the Gallup Strength Achiever, uh, where where the basement of that achiever is doesn't celebrate success, never says thank you, nothing's ever enough. Yeah, the downside of that drive. That would be one of my top fives. So that's the appeal of the book. That's brilliant. Uh, Peyton, thank you very much indeed for giving me your time today and being on the show. Absolutely. My pleasure, Doc. Anytime. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. As a token of your appreciation, it'd be fantastic if you could go wherever you're listening and leave me a review. Those reviews really help other people find this podcast. For all information relating to this episode, you can go to dominicmonkhouse.com forward slash podcast. And there you'll find some fantastic show notes, additional reading and links relating to this episode. You can also find my blog and the past editions of my subjectively not crap newsletter. The simplest thing to do on the website is to sign up and I'll update you each week on the most interesting articles that I've read on all things relating to scaling up, high-performing teams, net promoter score, company culture, etc. For social, you can find me on Twitter at Dom Monkhouse and LinkedIn at Dominic Monkhouse, although LinkedIn is probably the best way to reach me, share your questions and comments, and, and perhaps even recommend a guest for a future edition of the Melting Pot podcast. 
Thanks for listening.